So good evening to all the participants. Good evening to the um, to the management. Good evening to the director, Gayatri Ma'am. Good evening to our trustee, um, Rajdeep Bunshar. Uh, thank you for this amazing opportunity. Good evening. Good morning to uh, uh, Josh. Uh, thank you for this uh, amazing opportunity. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, just to give, um, um, it's obvious Josh does not require an introduction, but um, he's the man behind um, Shape Grammar. Joe Spinto Duarte is the Stuckenman Chair in Design Innovation and the Director of Stuckenman Center for Design Computing. Duarte is also a Professor of Architecture and Landscape Architecture and Affiliate Professor of Architectural Engineering and Engineering Design at Penn State. So after obtaining his doctoral degree from MIT, Duarte returned to Portugal where he helped launch technology-oriented architecture degrees and programs as well as a digital prototyping and fabrication lab. He was the Dean of the University uh, at Lisbon School of Architecture and President of ECAD, the European Association of, uh, for Education and Research in Computer Aided Design. His research interests are in the use of computation to support context sensitive uh, design at different scales from urban design to architecture and material design. He recently co-edited with Branco the book Mass Customization and Design Democracy and his team was awarded second place in the finals of the NASA 3D printed mass habitat challenge for printing subscale habitat. And he has written a lot of uh, uh, resources, theory, and um, um, along with uh, collaborative research efforts funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology and private uh, companies. Um, so we welcome you, host, for this, uh, Joe's, for this uh, um, webinar where we have. Um, um, a diverse uh, range of audience ranging from architects to students and uh, other colleagues. Uh, good evening to one all present here and thank you for your participation. Um, here we have uh, Joe's and we uh, give the um, platform for him to present and take over. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, everybody, or good afternoon, depending when uh, where you are. Uh, dear Raghav, thank you very much for these very kind invitations. My pleasure um, to be talking to your audience. I'm going to start sharing my screen uh, so that I can start with the presentation. Let me know if everything is uh, visible and fine once I complete this. So let me do this. Can you see the presentation? Yep. Very good. So um, as Raghav mentioned, I will ta be talking to you today about the work uh, that we developed for the NASA competition. But before, I will explain the roots of that work, at least from my, my side. Uh, I have to say most of the work that I will be showing, it's the work of a team, not just my work. It's a group uh, of a group of people uh, that work together at Penn State to make these things happen. Um, so let me get, talk to you a little bit about uh, the context. Um, so I direct the Stuckman Center for Design and Computing. And the mission of the center is to support the integration of digital technologies in design and in construction. But the focus is not on technology, but on strategically deploying technology to address contemporary societal issues. So the goal is to contribute for the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which you can see on your screen. Obviously, we are a little more committed to some than others, like providing a shelter is a, a very important issue for the center. So basically, we are using digital technology to solve um, design uh, problems. So, and this is a big one. So what you see on your screen uh, is uh, the a graph showing the growth of human population. And if you look carefully at the graph, you will have to come to the conclusion that we will need to build over the next 20 years as many houses as we have built in the past 2000 years. Again, in 20 years, with as many houses as we have built in the past 2000 years. So this is a huge problem. And therefore, you know, it needs uh, innovative uh, solutions. This is also to say that the research of the center, although it's a technology-oriented center, it's socially motivated. So what concerns us is not the technology, but the people. So this describes uh, this problem. 
given the growth of the population, particularly in cities, uh, people have to find ways uh, to build their own houses, which you can see on the upper left corner. So this is an, uh, a aerial view of an informal settlement in Brazil, which we uh, call uh, favelas. Um, so there are many qualities. It's especially complex. It's a very tight knit community, but it has also many problems. It does not have uh, infrastructure and does not have public spaces. Although on the right hand side, you see the usual governmental approach and you can see it also has problems. It's very monotonous, very homogeneous. It does have infrastructure, but it does not have public spaces either. So none of this is what we want. And what we would like to have is what you see at the bottom on the left-hand side. So this is a view of a historical uh, settlement that grew incrementally over time. These places quite often become touristic attractions for a good reason, because they are pleasant. They have a, a tight-knit community. They are specially rich. Uh, they are lively. So people like uh, to live in those places. So the focus of my research since many years ago, in fact, decades, is to find design methodologies to be able to build environments that have the qualities that we value in historical settlements. So we don't want the favelas, we don't want the governmental approach. We want something that resembles the qualities that we value in historical settlements. So let's step back a little bit and look at the problem a little bit more closely. According to the United Nations, 900 million people live in informal settlements, and it is estimated that this number will double by 2025. So this is a huge scale of the problem. And these informal settlements have the qualities, which you can see in white, and have the problems, which you can see in red. So they are sustainable, they are centrally located, they are complex, they are stimulating environments, especially very rich. They are affordable, otherwise they would not exist and they are very colorful. But they don't have infrastructure, they have no green spaces, there is a huge ecological impact, a negative ecological impact, and there are no public spaces. So our stance is the following. Informal settlements are not a problem, but a solution with problems. So can we learn from them? So what I'm proposing is to use them as a reference for a new method of planning and designing a low income urban areas. And the idea is that digital technology can provide the means to develop uh, applying such methods. So uh, since a few years ago, I have created uh, the World Studio. So the World Studio is a, a platform to patch, uh, test, teach, and develop new methods and technologies. So basically, there is a research project, which aim is the study of these informal settlements. And there is a studio, a design studio that I teach at Penn State that uses the methodologies that we develop and then applies them and then uh, uses use as a platform to come up with new um, ideas. So what is a solution? So what you see on this slide is the DNA code. It's the code of life. So if you uh, tweak the code a little bit, you end up with a slightly different living creature. So, but this does not happen randomly. So the idea is that the species evolve uh, so that they are the fittest to their environment. So that's the idea that I want to bring into architecture. The code that you can tweak and that you can use to develop buildings that are the fittest to the context where they are built. So that's the main idea. So, it just happens, uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, if you look back into the history of architecture, you'll find uh, that there are books that were written many years ago, in fact, millennia ago, that describe how to design buildings. And these books were written in such a rigorous way that's really uh, relatively straightforward to turn them into computer programs. Uh, and that's what I did with some of my students. I used to teach a class on programming for architects and designers. Uh, and one of the students uh, turned the chapter in one of these books into a computer program. So the book was by the Roman architect Vitruvius, was written 2000 years ago. And what he did was convert the chapter on how to build 
theaters into a computer program. So the computer program asks you for how many spectators. And once you type in the number of spectators, it will, in a matter of seconds, generate a 3D model of a theater. So what you see on the right hand side is actually the, uh, at the top, the output of the program. So a theater for 5,000 spectators and a theater for uh, 15,000 um, spectators. And then what you see here on the left hand side is actually the code and the program working to generate the theater. So first part of the idea, you have a computer program that can generate customized designs. In this case, customized theaters. And what you are customizing is the number of spectators. But then the, the second part of the idea is actually to find an easy way to materialize the designs. So we are resorting to uh, digital fabrication, or in this case, to rapid prototyping. So we have uh, used 3D printing to take as input the output of the computer program and very quickly fabricate a 3D physical model of the output of the computer program, which is what you see here on the bottom on the right hand side. So this is actually a physical model, a picture of a physical model that was created from the output of the computer program using fused deposition modeling, which is a digital fabrication um, technique. So this slide summarizes the solution. So on one hand, we have a design system that takes as input information about the context, the requirements, and outputs a design solution. If you look more closely into the design system, you need uh, actually four subsystems. One that reads the context and formulates the problem. It outputs the design brief. Another one that takes a design brief and generates candidate solutions. So different solutions that satisfy the design brief. So once you have the ability to generate different solutions, you need to find a way to rate and rank them. So that's what the evaluation system does. So we are able to actually compare different solutions and see which one seems to be the better for the context. So you also need a search mechanism uh, to find the optimal solution, the optimized solution for that particular context. So what you see in this slide is actually uh, some of these uh, systems working. So you see an interface uh, that was uh, designed by <clears throat> one of the SCDC researcher a few years ago. Uh, it's a tangible interface that people can use uh, to develop uh, their own house, to design their own customized house. So it's very easy. So anyone can actually use it. <clears throat> then here, what you see is actually, um, you know, another program that does the same thing, but at the <clears throat> urban uh, design level. So by using these different programs, you can generate either customized houses, like you see here on the left uh, bottom corner, or a customized urban environment, you know, a very diverse. So it shows that you can actually use the computer systems to design customized houses and diverse and rich urban environments. So um, I ran uh, the World Studio, as I said, and this year we actually were in India. So we went, I took the students to Ahmedabad, team up with a local architect called Harpan Jawari and worked together with SEPT uh, in Ahmedabad um, to uh, design uh, a development for low-income people in a section of the city. So in this studio, what students do, they design by writing computer programs. Uh, so they write programs to generate customized houses, uh, which you see here on the, the, the top uh, corner. And you have uh, you know, also uh, programs to generate the urban environment. So basically, you, the output of a studio is a tool that you can use to generate different solutions for the environment. Uh, and then you can create very rich and diverse, non-monotonous environments like you see here in this uh, picture. So, but once you have the ability uh, to generate the customized designs, you also need the ability to materialize them. 
So you need a production system. The production system takes as input uh, the design solution and produces uh, you know, a physical version of it. And they both use computer systems. So what we are doing, we are taking uh, advantage of the high processing power of the computer to link information about the context to uh, information about the design solution and control the production system. The production system can take different forms. In one case, you, you have the idea of a kit of parts uh, that you can assemble in different ways to generate different configurations. Or, uh, you know, more recently, you have the possibility of additive construction of 3D printing buildings. So do you go directly from the solution to the physical version of the building? Uh, so what you see here on this slide is actually uh, exactly that. So on the left hand side, you see the idea of the kit of parts. Standard components like the Lego system, the, the children's toy, that you can uh, combine in different ways to generate the customized houses. And on the right hand side, you see the idea of 3D printing. So you have a large robotic arm that can actually 3D print um, the house. So let's talk about the system for making the house, which is the focus of my presentation uh, today. So this uh, sh slide shows the work of one of my PhD students. Um, he had this idea of uh, fabricating customized uh, materials. So if you look at the human bone, what do you have? You have a non-homogeneous structure. So the bones are denser when they need to be stronger. And they are less dense when they can be lighter. They don't need to be as strong. So this is basically the idea to change the properties of the material by changing its composition. So once you use simulation tools, like structural simulation tools, you know where the structure needs to be stronger. And therefore, you can actually change the composition of the material to make it strong in those areas. So how does it work? Consider concrete, for instance. So concrete as a binder and as aggregates. Usually, you will use Portland cement as the binder, and you use sand as the aggregate or gravel. Uh, so, but you can replace part of the aggregates by uh, a different material, by a lighter material, like cork granules. So by changing the amount of cork relatively to sand, you can change the properties of the material. You can get a very strong material that's heavier, or you can get a lighter material that's not as strong, but has better thermal insulation properties, for instance. So you can customize the design of building elements to make them the, the optimal uh, for the context. So what you see in this slide is actually the 3D printer to do this. So the part that's being printed, it's non-homogeneous. So it has 100% sand as an aggregate at one corner and it has on the other corner it has been replaced partially replaced by cork granules which you can see here you know it's we call it cork uh, cement um, so what by doing this you can actually imagine for instance to increase the amount of cork on the outer layer of a wall to shield it from the difference in temperature to the outside so you're actually you know improving the performance of the building by customizing the design of the building part. Another colleague of mine in our group uh, developed what we call seamless transition between concrete and glass. So she developed the ability to transition seamlessly between you know, concrete and glass. So it's basically the same idea. It's a functionally graded material in which glass progressively becomes concrete and vice versa. So what this allows us to do is to de design buildings without formwork. So, so you can actually generate a completely sealed environment, which we will see was very useful for the NASA competition. But 3D printing in concrete is a very complex endeavor. It's a very complex system with many different variables and they are all interrelated. So part of the effort is to model the relationships between the different variables. So create the model so that we know 
if something changes, like for instance, if the air temperature changes, we will adjust the printing settings accordingly, for instance. So you have materials with different compositions that have different properties. And they need a, you know, some rheological properties to be able to be extrudable. So what we need to do is to find out once we change the value of one of these variables, how that's going to affect the value of others. So you can actually uh, print successfully. Because when we don't do that, this is what happens. Everything seems to be going fine. And then at some point, the structure will collapse because uh, you know, it did not have enough time to set because there was too much water and so on. So we need to model the relationships to be able to be successful. Uh, so we have designed different mixtures. So we have people in the team that are material scientists uh, and they design different mixtures with different properties that we have uh, tested and experimented with and chosen the ones that uh, allowed us to print more successfully. We also design the printing system. So we have developed systems with different configurations that are adjusted to different uh, conditions. And then you have also to study the behavior of the material because concrete is a very complex material. It's not like plastic. In plastic, once you extrude the material and deposit it, it sets very quickly. Concrete takes time. And while it has not hardened, it will deform under its own weight or under the weight of the layers that are printed above. So we need to model the behavior of the material. You need to model the deformation because if you don't do that, we don't print what we designed. So we need to compensate for material deformation so that at the end, we have exactly what we designed. And that's something that we are doing as well. At the same time, we need to check for the structural performance. We need to make sure that the materials that we print have the right uh, properties. So we run tests to find out how to create you know, building parts that are strong enough to be able to use in construction. So this shows some of the images of what we did during the NASA competition in this regard. And then we also need to develop other kinds of uh, abilities uh, and features. For instance, in this case, what you see is a system to automatically place openings while we are 3D printing. So this is actually an image of a test that we run before the competition just to program the robot. But you can see, so the idea is that you use a robot to automatically place uh, the openings. And we do this uh, you know, um, with the reinforcement as well we produce, you need to make sure that the structure can be completely sealed because we were building houses for Mars and, and, and Mars needs a pressurized environment so that uh, the interior does not run out of oxygen. Uh, and then you need to make sure that the structure can endure successive uh, uh, cycles of freeze and thaw because on Mars, there's a wide range of temperatures between day um, and night. At the same time, we also want to understand which kind of shapes we can design with 3D printing. So part of our goal is actually to be able to print structures without formwork so that we make construction as cheap as possible and as simple as possible. So these are some images of the tests that we have carried out to find out, for instance, what's the maximum printing angle, which kind of shapes can we print and you can see that you can actually create very complex shapes with very nice and beautiful uh, aesthetically pleasing surfaces. We all, so one of our goals is actually to print structures that are fully enclosed and that can be 3D printed without formwork. So that's what you can see on this slide. Uh, you know, it's a structure uh, that, you know, so you can imagine it, this is the room and this is the roof of the room. This is a dome that will enclose um, that structure. So um, this resembles some of the vernacular architecture that, can, that you can find around the world. So another thing that we are doing is actually learn from historic precedents. So we are looking at vernacular architecture that work very well under compression and see which kind of shapes have worked in the past 
that did not require reinforcement. So you can have build structures that are strong enough to be able to be used um, you know, for uh, houses and, and, and so on. Um, and at the same time, because you want to have the ability to go to different places and print houses on different locations, you need to find a way to deploy the printing system in a simple way. So, you know, so it's easy to transport, and easy to set up. So the logistics of the operation is also uh, very important. So what you see on this slide is actually, you know, the truck that we use to ship all the printing system to uh, the, where the competition was taking place, which was in Peoria, Illinois, which has about 15 hours, a 15 hour drive from Penn State. And here is actually the, an image of the setup, you know, how we, that we use for printing at the competition. Um, so we are basically designing in the competition, we're designing for two different environments. So we had to design houses for Mars, but at the same time, we needed uh, uh, to use the system to print on Earth. Um, so let's see how we overcome the problem. So we basically, you know, you know, Earth and Mars are very different. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, a very uh, one third of the Earth gravity. So it changes. So the conditions are different. The temperature is different, and so on. So what did we do? So basically, we develop a platform a beam-based platform to be able to generate the design. And what we did uh, was exactly what I showed at the beginning. So we create a platform to generate customized designs. So it has the ability to generate candidate solutions. Uh, so we use parametric design in this case. And then we use software to check for the performance of the generated solution from the structural viewpoint, from the environmental viewpoint, or from the constructability viewpoint. Um, so once we have the ability to generate different solutions and rate and rank them, we can use optimization to find the best for a given context. Uh, that's exactly what you use by using multi-objective optimization. But at the same time, you need to simulate construction. Why? Because you need to make sure that, for instance, the robots will not collide while printing, because we will have one robot printing the structure, another robot placing the openings. So we need to make sure that we will not collide. So that's something that we need to take into account. So we are optimizing not just the design, but we are also optimizing the process. We're optimizing everything. So we use this platform um, to uh, design the building, design the printing system, design the setup, and design the construction process. So it's what we call holistic uh, design. So. Here you see an image of uh, the generative component of the, of the system. Uh, so it's parametric design. So we use basically um, Revit and uh, Dynamo, which is you know, the visual scripting language of Dynamo to uh, implement uh, the design system. And what we did was actually to incorporate in the parametric design system, the constraints of the printing system. For instance, it would not allow us to generate structures that could not be printable. Uh, so that was a, a, a very important aspect of the platform that we uh, developed. So then we were able you know, to uh, generate the building and the process for making the building as well. We used uh, simulation and analysis tools for uh, structural performance or environmental performance and for construction uh, performance as well. And then uh, we use optimization. So what you see here is actually the system at work. So the system is trying to find what are the best values for the different variables that will generate uh, an optimized design from the structural, environmental, uh, and constrict constrictive uh, viewpoint. So basically you see you know, the variables changing, it's uh, ranking the printing time. So the printing time is also a big issue. So we want uh, you know, to design something that takes the least amount of time to be uh, printed. Um, so it's also a very important uh, feature. So because we are using this platform for design to different environments, the output was obviously different. 
So what we designed for Mars was different than what we designed for Earth, but the same design system. So you see the output of the system for Mars and the output of the system uh, for Earth, you know, completely different um, structures. I mean, they resemble, there are some similarities, but you know, they have different configurations. And this is actually an image of uh, the um, setup. So it's showing because to qualify for the finals of the competition, we needed to convince the judges that we knew what we were doing, that we knew how to set up, we knew how to place everything on site and show that we could actually print. So this is actually the animation that we submitted for the competition to show that we have the ability um, to uh, print on, on site. So you see, you know, two big trucks that were used to transport the system. You see a very large silo uh, to use, uh, that was used to store the materials and the small silo that was used to feed the printer. So the printer is here and it's extruding uh, and the robotic arm uh, you know, as a nozzle that's extruding the building. And there's another robot that will place the openings as you saw initially uh, in the movie. Uh, so it's building uh, up to the um, top of the openings and now it's placing the openings. And once you place the different openings, it will continue printing until it encloses the structure. So another window and I'm gonna place uh, the last one and now it's gonna generate um, the structure. So, and this is actually an image of the actual uh, construction uh, during the competition. So for us, it was a thrill to see the structure finally being printed. So we had never printed something so big before we actually went to the competition. So for us to see the structure that we have designed uh, using all this digital technology to become a reality was very exciting. Um, obviously, you know, uh, the process was, was not completely seamless because the technology was still uh, being developed. But we were able, we managed to print the first fully enclosed 3D printing structure. What I mean is that we did not use any kind of prefabrication. So we printed the structure from uh, the ground up to the roof uh, continuously, uh, you know, printed. So we did not use anything to cap the structure. Everything was printed. And that's because we, we were able to find out the maximum printing angle and we optimized the design of the structure for, um, you know, the, the process. Another image of the setup, as you can see, it got uh, very complex at some point. You know, the, the people you see in, uh, with the yellow shirts are the judges. So anytime we had to stop, and we had to stop sometimes because the machine got clogged, for instance, we would lose points. Um, and then at the end, this is what we were able to do. So as you can see, it's a very large structure has about uh, five meters high. Uh, it's uh, eight meters long and five meters wide. So it's a very large structure, but it's still one third of the actual size. So part of the work that we are developing now is to uh, scale up, to be able to build larger uh, structures. And at the end of the competition, we actually had uh, to test the structure for structural strength. So we have this big caterpillar machines trying to crush the structure and we did quite well uh, for a structure that had, had no reinforcement other than uh, fibers. Um, so before I finish, let me show you a movie that we created to celebrate our accomplishment. So hopefully um, you'll be able to hear the movie. Let me just raise uh, the sound as much as possible. On May 3rd, 2019, in Peoria, Illinois, a team of Penn Staters made history. They became the first ever to build a fully enclosed 3D printed habitat at architectural scale without any support structure beneath. 
It was the final round of NASA's 3D Printed Habitat Challenge competition to design and build a structure suitable for Mars. The achievement, a culmination of years of research and design from an interdisciplinary team led by Penn State faculty. The idea here was not to design a common building, but to innovate the construction process and the architecture. So I got interested in digital fabrication, and particularly on the 3D printing of concrete. We made what we call functionally graded materials. The idea is that you replace part of the aggregates in the concrete with a lightweight material that has a good insulation properties, for instance, cork. I had a vision to transition seamlessly between concrete and glass without the use of any mechanical frame or bonding agents. That would make such a difference in architecture if you were able to do something like that. We developed what we call Marscrete, which is a kind of concrete that's made of materials that can be found on Mars. Constructing a habitat on Mars had new challenges for us. When you go to Mars, you're dealing with a lot of loads that we designed the structure, we designed the material, we designed the reinforcement to resist those loads so that we provide a safe structure. My role as part of this team was to really think about the systems aspects. How do we go from the micro scale to the macro scale? That's a big systems challenge. Another revolutionary approach was to design the building and the process simultaneously using artificial intelligence and building information modeling. This enabled the team to produce a building that not only pushed the limits, but in fact could be built. There were eight levels in the competition that involved nearly 80 teams from around the world. Only two reached the final round. We only got our robotic arm about two weeks before we went to the competition, so we were learning things in real time. Both teams set out to build their subscale structure in just three days. We had never actually tested printing the entire thing. By day three, it was down to the wire. The last kit was the most difficult one. It was going very slowly. It seemed that it lasts forever. The team finished with just 11 minutes remaining on the clock. Seeing everything being printed all together at the same time was like seeing a dream coming true. We are very proud. We've achieved this goal of creating the very first building that is completely 3D printed, including the roof. This is something that hasn't really been achieved on this scale before. You look at the challenge that was set before us, the team that we brought together, and then the competition venue, it was really quite amazing. I'm really proud of my team and how we were able to achieve this. Everybody was needed, every person on there was vital. If we would have missed one of those skill sets, we couldn't have done it. Being a part of that and being a part of the success of that was very rewarding. Once a lifetime experience, really. We can really push the limits. What we think is the limit today becomes just the innovation of tomorrow and then just the everyday use material the day after. I think that someday we would be able to build on Mars and eventually live on Mars. And looking forward to that thing. Nothing is impossible. We can do everything in a team as long as we are dedicated and responsible for whatever we have. We have used the competition to accelerate our research. This has enabled us to do our research much more quickly and gain more visibility. Our mission is to use all these innovations and the experience that we have gained to make an impact, to make a difference in the real construction. Penn State allows us to unite forces between various disciplines and bring ideas together. So, you know, this is the team, or our team, that worked hard for the competition, continuing, continues working hard to continue developing um, the research. So this ends my uh, presentation. You see here my latest book, which I've developed with uh, Branko Kolarevich. It's on mass customization and use of mass customization in architecture. And you will be able to find more information about the center that is 
uh, web address. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joss. It was an amazing uh, presentation, uh, actually a motivating one. Um, the, um, it's, qu it's quite different from how we treat different on Earth. Um, the, um, so um, can we head to, into the question um, session? Like uh, we have a few questions who, you know, we would like to sure. shoot them to you. Um, how did this vision of uh, 3D printing at Mars start? Where is it? Which was the origin? Of uh, printing on Mars? Yeah. So uh, as you can see, uh, NASA had launched this uh, competition um, to develop the technology to be able to print on Mars one day. And we were already developing the technology to print on Earth. So we saw the NASA competition as an opportunity to raise funding, to showcase our work, and to very quickly continue uh, developing the technology because we had very strict deadlines. So basically, it helped us to set the pace to very quickly develop the technology, develop something that we were already doing. That's basically uh, the idea. And what are the challenges, you know, how different it is from 3D printing? Because uh, we worked on a project back, um, like a few years back, where we printed clay on Earth. So we didn't have to face a lot of issues on gravity or the different soil conditions um, back in Spain. But I see that you have handled a lot of other, um, 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 you know, um, other issues like gravity or uh, the, the material as well. So, um, so um, at the end of the day, the problem is formulated in the same way. So what changes is the conditions. But mm -hmm. once you build a platform that's able to generate different design configurations and compare them you know, in terms of performance, then you can actually develop for any environment as long as the technology that we're using allows you to do it. For instance, we needed to find out uh, what was the maximum printing angle that we could use while printing. Because if you use one that was lower, it would collapse. So there was lots of testing before. So we had to develop all these tests to be able to create a model of the process and use that model to design the product. That's basically the idea. You, you, know, you create a platform that encodes all the variables associated with the process and then use it to design the product. Nice. Um, so how do you think 3D printing will transform the construction industry? So I believe that uh, within 10 years, uh, 3D printing will become a standard uh, in the construction industry. We are uh, at the beginning. Um, so 3D printing at large scale started in the mid 90s. Uh, so there is already some companies that are using 3D printing today to make um, houses, but the technology is still not there quite yet. I mean, it's getting there. So in very, it will get there very quickly. Yeah, so, we see in Dubai, we see in Russia, we see in China as well. Right, so what, what's the impact? Okay, so you can simplify construction mm -hmm. because instead of having different trades and a large number of people on site, you have fewer people and fewer trades. So you basically you are simplifying, make it faster and cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the big impact on the construction industry. But also, you can actually improve, uh, you know, uh, the performance in terms of uh, ecological impact. Let me give an mm -hmm. example. So for Mars, we had to develop a concrete that could be made out of materials found on Mars, made out of indigenous materials. So we had to look at the materials that were available on Mars and select those that could be used to make concrete and then test them because in some of them are actually exist on earth. So we ended up developing a new kind of concrete. Um, I mean, new in terms of the, the exact mixture because th this type of concrete has been around for a while, it's a geopolymer. Uh, and we found out that first, geopolymers uh, consume less energy to be produced than Portland uh, cement. Mm -hmm. So basically you are consuming less resources. We are actually improving the construction industry in terms of the ecological impact. That's an amazing uh, initiative. 
Um, so uh, oh, just out of this presentation, we are very curious because um, like I personally have uh, taught shape grammar for my students. Uh, you know, I have personally learned uh, shape grammar. So uh, you being the man behind the process of shape grammar, how did that happen? How did that moment happen? And um, because that is history for us and that is an amazing moment for us. Right. So uh, actually I started this research while I was still in college. And that was, as you can see, many years ago. Um, and I became interested in using the computer, not because I particularly like computers. I mean, I don't like or dislike them. I see them as a tool, mm -hmm. but I didn't became interested in using the computer because I was a computer freak or I was, you know, a technology freak. I just perceive that they could be used to solve uh, design problems mm -hmm. in a way that we could not solve them without using the computer. So I became interested in uh, algorithms and using, uh, you know, algorithms to generate design, algorithms to design. Um, and at some point, you know, obviously I, I went, uh, I, I got my uh, graduate education from MIT. I went to MIT and I, I was just lucky, you know, the, per, the right people were there. Uh, they had the knowledge that I needed to continue doing my work. Um, and shape grammar is actually a very good way of uh, representing design knowledge in a visual way. So they make it easier for you as a designer to create, generate and create the algorithms because our algorithms are about shapes, are about the visual information and shape grammars are very good at doing that. For instance, at the end, I don't implement them as shape grammars into the computer, although that could be done. Um, but you know, to implement a shape grammar is a quite um, a complex um, problem. But anyway, uh, what uh, we did was actually to uh, you know, use the shape grammars to um, develop the, um, you know, the algorithm so as a way of representing. And even for the functionally graded materials, I use the shape grammar. Uh, so that's very interesting. So I'm actually printing in, on, in concrete and by using shape grammars in the background. So that's interesting. Amazing, um, because we have learned that as a tool to, uh, to define architecture, to actually uh, understand architecture. We uh, have a particular um, subject as well, where we talk about contemporary process in architecture. And shape grammar is a very important subject for us to criticize buildings, to understand buildings from the past till now. We use it as a tool. Um, so, Coming back to the presentation, how far do you think artificial intelligence will have a role in the future of architecture and how it's going to support and how are we going to be prepared for that moment? So I can have, uh, I think it can have a very important role um, in many ways. So as you know, today when people say artificial intelligence, they are mainly thinking about machine learning. But artificial intelligence has different paradigms. So learning is one of them. But there are others, you know, you have rule-based design system and shape grammars actually fall into that category. So you can use uh, different AI paradigms to solve different problems. Let's talk about machine learning. Let's talk about, you know, you want to understand the correlation between different variables in the system and the system in this case might be a building. Let's say you have defined the building parametrically and you need a way, uh, or, or for, let, let me give you an example of a work of one of my students. She's interested in the design of microgrids. So microgrids are communities that can produce their own energy. So she wants to find out the correlation between urban configurations and energy balance. So, so basically what she wants to do is to be able to design optimal solutions from the energy balance viewpoint. So what, what is she doing? This is a very complex problem. It's urban design and lots of buildings with different configurations, you know, topography and so on. So she's describing, she found descriptors of urban configurations. I think it's about 17 of them. Um, and she tries to find out the correlation between the different variables and the energy balance, energy consumption and energy production. So she able to find out what are the values of all these variables that will lead to better solutions? And then by reversing this, she can use this as a design tool. Uh, I'm not sure I was clear in my explanation, but- uh, Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we sort of uh, get the importance of artificial intelligence 
um, and being a person you have used artificial intelligence in this project so um, I think um, like we can understand the significance of um, AI and agents uh, becoming a significant you know, playing a significant role and what sort of resources do you, uh, you know, suggest for students to look out for? Um, so let me uh, give you an example. Uh, a few years ago when I was doing my master's at MIT and I was looking for an advisor. Um, and one day I went to the library and I was looking for books and I saw this amazing book. It was a beautiful book, you know, very well written. So I basically I spent the night at the library without noticing, just reading the book. Um, I think that's a good way to start. The name of the book is The Logic of Architecture, Logic of Architecture. written by my, uh, one of my advisors, Bill Mitchell. And I would recommend reading that book to understand more about the link between algorithms and architecture. It's a very good book. So it basically, um, you know, it describes uh, these ideas in a way that can be understood by anyone in a very mm -hmm. simple way. So that's a good book. And logic, then, you know, logic of take, the logic of architecture. And it takes time, uh, you know, uh, to get to this level of proficiency. So you need to be patient. Uh, in, maybe you should start, start by learning a programming language, which is the start of it. So when you learn a programming language, um, you are not just doing, you are not just learning that particular language. You're actually learning how to encode architectural knowledge in a, in a format that's amenable uh, to computer implementation. So learn a programming language. Uh, I think everybody should learn a programming language these days. Uh, and then, you know, be patient, you know, continue learning. Um, what sort of reinforcement do you use for 3D printed concrete like in this particular project? So we are experimenting with different techniques. At the competition, we used fibers, small fibers uh, that were about, uh, um, you know, I think in this case was uh, one inch, uh, less than one inch long. Uh, we use carbon fibers, um, but we are also uh, experimenting with techniques that uh, uh, to automatically place reinforcement, traditional reinforcement like rebars mm -hmm. um, and meshes and so on. Um, so there are different possibilities. Obviously, there are difficulties in applying, uh, you know, traditional reinforcement methods in 3D printing. So you can apply reinforcement, you know, before you start printing, during printing, and after printing. Mm -hmm. You can so it's a wide range of possibilities. Pre-production and post-production. Yes. So we have a few questions related to the same one uh, we have put forward. So what sort of foundation did you use uh, for 3D printing structures? And because in March there is an anti-gravity situation, so how would you tackle that from one of the uh, participants? So the idea was to use the robot to actually mm -hmm. prepare the site. So the robot, the robot would dig, so would use as a milling machine to dig uh, the sites a little bit and level and dig uh, the site and then print on the top of it. Mm -hmm. So you basically, we use a continuous foundation. Uh, we don't, we do not use pillars. Uh, we use a continuous foundation. And then there's uh, one more participant who's, who's talking about um, structural analysis. You spoke about structural analysis. Uh, done before printing. So um, uh, he's asking what sort of, um, is it climate responsive or is it incorporated into the design as well? So, um, um, so uh, the conditions on Mars are so different that while on Earth, vertical loads are more important than lateral loads, on Mars is different. It's basically oh. the reverse because you need to pressurize the structure. So you need, uh, you know, there is no atmosphere out there. So it's 1% of our Earth atmosphere. So you need to get a pressurized environment, which means that the structure tends to explode, right? Because, it, you know, it has this enormous pressure inside. So lateral loads become much more important than vertical loads. And that changes completely the way you analyze the structure. So how, how does that uh, dome shape um, support in this lateral load? Um, so we had, and that's why we start using a simulation, uh, structural simulation. Um, so it's a fully enclosed structure. 
that's uh, whose interior is pressurized. So you need to make sure that the walls were thick enough to be able to contain um, the pressure and that the shape was good enough to hold the pressure. So that's why we used optimization to find out what, what was the best configuration to endure that enormous pressure. And what, there's one more participant who was asking about oxygen level and um, the need for that and mass. Does that really affect the 3D printing? So one of my colleagues, uh, a member of our team, uh, named uh, Alexander Radlinska, is studying how concrete sets in the absence of gravity. So actually what we did, we sent some samples to the International Space Station uh, or, you know, of concrete. And then there were some experiments that were conducted by the astronauts there to see how concrete sets in the absence of gravity. So we use that information in the competition as well. Right. That's amazing. No, you have a team which has different expertise to support you in different uh, right. things. So it's, it's a very interdisciplinary team. So we have basically architects, uh, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, material scientists, uh, no, systems engineers, electrical engineers, uh, you know, even artists. So wow. you can see <coughs> it's a very large team of people. Multidisciplinary team, yeah. And <coughs> what are the next steps in NASA? So um, taking it... So um, we are not sure yet, but it seems that the next stage of the competition or the next competition will target the moon, not Mars. <laughs> Uh, so we actually were invited by NASA to participate as one of the winning teams to participate in a series of meetings to help define the framework for the next level of the competition. Probably next year it will take place. We don't know yet, but uh, you know we are not uh, stopped. We continue developing our research, uh, but now we are focused on you know developing low-income housing for Earth. And that was one of the questions from uh, the participants as well. How are we going to use this um, sort of uh, research on back on Earth to for maybe public uh, landscaping or civic structures or public buildings? Because in India we have a demand for affordable housing. In Africa, uh, where millions of people are homeless, and uh, even the government is, as well is uh, interested to um, you know to focus on affordable housing for the future. Um, so, this so, so uh, you know, so basically our mo initial motivation was actually to build houses on Earth. We just use the technology that we are developing to participate in the competition and use the competition to actually accelerate the development of the technology. But it's basically the same competition. You have these AI-based design tools that will help you to uh, optimize uh, the design for a particular location. Um, yeah, so it's basically the same technology. And but but the idea is that you use local materials. For instance, the concrete that we'll use in India probably will not be the same as the one you'll use in Africa or in the US and so on. Right, the, the, the climate as well, right? The, the setting time, the curing time, the time to print as well. So the same right. thing can be used for normal conventional affordable housing as well. That's what right, so remember that we're using functionally graded concrete. So you can change the percentage of cork. So probably in a very hot climate or in a very cold climate, we have to increase the amount of cork. So, but the, everything is tailored, can be tailored to the specific site conditions. Okay. Um, so what, any plans for, 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 like for architects or for scientists to go to Mars and print, like to see a structure getting printed? Do you have any of that? Out of just of, out of curiosity. Um, well, uh, I, I'm sure that will happen at some point. Uh, SpaceX, as you know, has launched the uh, you know yeah. Uh, yeah, the rockets uh, uh, a few days article. ago. Yeah, few and they ago. they actually contacted us. Who knows? Maybe we will yeah. uh, you know collaborate with them. Yeah, maybe two people you know go there and then three D print in the near future. It'll be so exciting to see um, uh, this act you know, becoming a reality. Just uh, coming back to the shape grammar, um, I, I read one article where you say um, shape grammar uh, that um, you know supports in urban designing systems as well, you know, and not just buildings, not just to um, architecture. It, um, 
there's a there's a process in where we can analyze uh, urban systems as well. So can you like just give us a brief on that? Yes. Um, so shape grammar is about rule based design, and at the end of the day, everything is rule based in some way or another. Uh, same thing happens with urban design. So a few years ago, we developed a, a platform that's a, a, a shape grammar based platform for urban design. It basically, has the same models that I talked about at the beginning. So it has a, a formulation model that allows mm -hmm. you to generate a design brief, which is the program for the urban intervention. It has a rule based design, um, you know, to generate different candidate solutions. There are simulation and analysis tool to check for the performance to evaluate uh, the candidate solutions and then uses optimization to find the optimal one. It's basically the same framework. But one important thing that we had to develop for urban design because you know it's a, it's a larger, it's a problem of a larger scale was to develop an ontology <clears throat> to, this very, to describe not just the environment, not just the urban environment, but also the urban development process. Mm -hmm. So we basically use the ontology to structure the software that we developed. Right. Um, there's a question from a participant saying, apart from this concrete, have you worked on any smart construction material? Yes, um, very interesting question. That's exactly what we are doing now. So we, I have a, a PhD student working in one of our uh, projects that's basically, uh, you know, about the use of um, smart materials, in this case, uh, shape changing materials, to create responsive facades. So, so basically what she's developing is the technology to design a facade that can, you know, change its configuration to maximize the performance, for instance, mm -hmm. to maximize the capture of natural lighting. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, but you know, at the end of the day, everything is more or less the same. Basically, mm -hmm. what we're doing, she's modeling uh, the system. She's, you know, identifying uh, the design variables <clears throat> connected to the shape and to the material, and link that to performance. It's basically the same from framework. So I, I call it this magic framework because it basically mm -hmm. allows you to address any kind of design problem. Yeah, coincidentally, we at uh, our school as well for the first year. Uh, students, we had a parametric design exercise last uh, during the lockdown, and we worked on the same similar exercise where uh, first year undergraduate students work on a, a facade, a kinetic facade, where through passive or active systems they control the amount of light coming in. But the material stays the same. Uh, but if we have the opportunity to have a smart material, then you know it sort of takes its own course. Right. Actually, <clears throat> the first work that we did we use mechanical systems to change the configuration of the facade. Mm -hmm. But mechanical systems are very expensive mm -hmm. and they very easily uh, run out of order. So, yeah. you know, they break very easily. So, you know, they are, at the end of the day, they are not really feasible. <clears throat> so that's why we start using a smart material. So we're basically doing the same because in this case, it's, uh, you know, a piezoelectric material. So mm -hmm. basically uh, you have, you can change the configuration uh, by uh, using electricity, yeah. and then therefore the problem becomes on one of finding the optimal configuration, like in, in the case that I've just shown. So you need yeah. to find out, so you have, a, let's say, a facade made out of tiles that can change the configuration. Mm -hmm. You just need to know what's the, what should be the configuration of each tile in the system so that the performance of a system as a whole is the desired one. Right. Um, there's one more interesting question. What sort of insulation have you used in the structure to, <clears throat> in the sense, to block uh, sunlight or during winter? Yeah. So we used cork. So cork is a very light material. It has, uh, you know, very good properties. So uh, cork is, has a good thermal insulation properties, good acoustic insulation properties, works well under compression. It's uh, waterproof. It's, it's, it's quite a good uh, material, it's elastic. Um, so that's what we use. So we replaced part of the sand by cork granules. Nice, nice. Um, there's uh, another interesting question where um, uh, one of the participants is asking for resource to, to know more about space grammar. Or, or maybe a book. Um, so uh, there is one journal 
that has, you know, most of the articles that were published, not all of them, but, you know, uh, some of the most important articles, it's Environment and Planning B. It's a journal that's available online uh, and that you can, uh, you know, use to find out articles. Environment and Planning B. Environment and Planning B. So there's one article, it's in, I think it's um, Introduction to Shape Grammars. Um, I think that's the name of it. It's the basic article. So it basically describes the principles of the theory. And then you have tons of articles. Uh, but I would start with that one. I actually, I teach a shape grammar class. So shape grammar is for me a core class in our master's and PhD program. And it's also taken by undergrad students because it allows students, you know, teach, you can use shape grammar to teach students how to uh, articulate and write algorithms that are uh, relevant for design, architectural design, urban design, and so on. Um, so the way I structure the class, I start with that article. And then, you know, each week we uh, address uh, an aspect of the theory, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, compound shape grammars, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, for instance, computer implementation, um, and so on. So uh, there are um, articles um, about, it. basically what I'm trying to say, there are key issues on shape grammars that you need to learn to be able to actually use them. And you can learn them by reading these articles. So if you write, if you read the articles in the right sequence, you will very quickly learn enough about the theory to be able to use it. So this is, this is the uh, studio you take at Penn State or is it the Tukenman? So it's a, it's a class, it's a, a seminar class that I teach at Penn State in Penn the State. Architecture and Landscape Architecture School. So it's called the Stuckman School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, which okay. also includes uh, graphic design. Um, it's a, a, a class that's taught to undergrad and grad students at the same time. And actually people from outside the school come and take the, the shape grammar class. Yeah, because that is one of the questions. Where can we join for the workshops and learn more about uh, <laughs> so, I, um, you have just given, given me an idea. Maybe I can actually, you know, have a shape mm -hmm. grammar class taught online. Uh, so yeah. Be taken maybe. by uh, maybe, students. Maybe we'll host one. <laughs> yeah. So, That's a possibility. Yeah, possibility. That's a new business point. At, uh, why only concrete can be used as the material, not, not any other natural materials like taking a uh, cue from vernacular architecture like you mentioned? Um, so about other materials other than concrete that can be used concrete, for 3D printing. Yeah. Um, so other teams at the competition use thermoplastics. Mm -hmm. you no know, plastics that were actually made out of corn. <coughs> so that's not a possibility to use as a building material. But there's a difference, you know, you, in concrete you can print very fast. Mm -hmm. With thermoplastics it's very slow. Oh, yeah. So basically, it was quite interesting at the competition. Um, you know, um, there were two teams, as you, uh, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. in the finals. The other team was using plastics, and they took forever to print. Uh, we print that very quickly. And at the end, they actually were not able to, they won the competition, but they were not able to finish the structure. Uh, yeah, so I would use concrete. So unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, there's one more very interesting question. What will be the challenge in living at Mars then on Earth? Well, I, you know, we are human beings and at the end of the day, we need to live in an environment that's, you know, looks friendly. So mm -hmm. one of the aspects uh, that we uh, took into account is, was to create uh, an environment that was pleasing. So uh, our design concept was using models that you could print one at a time, but make them large enough and make the design by assembling different modules together complex enough so that you do not have the feeling that you have no place to hide for it. You want it to be alone. So, um, and you played with lights. So we basically tried to create an environment that was very pleasing, very good thing, you know, um, you know, nice to work, nice to uh, enjoy. Um, and that's the challenge. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to feel uh, balanced. Um, you need to feel that you are protected, that you feel safe. 
uh, that's beautiful in some way. So otherwise you'd go crazy, right? Yeah. So can we take one more question or? Sure. So, um, a very, um, very different question. Is the 3D printing the same at Moon or will it be different? I, I guess the process will be the same, but the way you print is gonna be different because gravity is different. Print, yeah. okay? um, and that changes everything. Um, but you know, we could use the same process. So basically I showed the same platform being used for Earth and Mars. We just need to plug in the specifics of Different the parameters, yeah. 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 Right. So um, I think um, participants are talking about wood. Why wood is not a good material to build on Mars? Uh, wood? Yeah. Okay, the, the disadvantage of using wood is that you'd have to take wood with you to Mars and that becomes very expensive. Um, whereas, you know, concrete, you can actually make concrete out of local materials that are available on the surface. You don't ne need to dig deep to find these materials. It would, it would be impossible, so it would be very expensive. Uh, I mean, maybe you can take some wood for some very particular applications, but certainly not to build uh, the entire structure. And um, there's always this question, you no know, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, um, you know, uh, removing, uh, increasing the unemployment um, among people, you know. Um, like oh, I see. Work, yeah. So, um, I mean, technology has evolved, uh, you know, since ever. And when it evolves, it changes the way we do things. Uh, so 3D printing technology is going to change the construction industry at some point. Um, so, you know, the skills required for people to work in the construction industry will change in some cases. So you need people to know how to operate these machines instead of carrying buckets or, you know, or, or laying uh, bricks. It just changes the set of skills that you need uh, to work for the industry. So we, we develop the skills to fight to, to stay up there. Is that what you mean? Yeah, you need, uh, you know, um, Upgrade. Like everything changes so quickly today uh, that you need to be continuously learning. Um, mm -hmm. So you cannot expect to learn a skill and, and that's it for life. No, it doesn't work. You need to completely update your knowledge uh, by learning new tools, new uh, concepts and so on. So um, I think uh, we're coming to the end of the session. Um, Josh, I would like to thank on behalf of the School of Architecture our uh, chairman, Raj Bikuna, our director, Guy Ma'am, and the whole fraternity. I would thank the uh, information technology team also to support and organize an uh, amazing uh, uh, seminar um, where, uh, webinar where we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have been, uh, had a very amazing interaction and uh, dialogue between us and an uh, amazing um, uh, project. We would not have the opportunity to see the process, what has gone behind behind the scenes of the competition. Maybe we Thank you so to... much for this very kind invitation. It has been my pleasure yeah. to do this. I, I was in India for the first time a few months ago, right before the lockdown, and enjoyed it so much. I hope to go back one day. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Director. Jose. Yeah. This, this is uh, Gayatri, director the of the director. college. This was a, a very good session. Actually, it was looking, uh, we were looking into a bigger form of a 3D model printer. <laughs> so, and uh, many of the students have attended, students from other colleges also have attended, and it is a very informative session. And I hope uh, we keep in touch in future. I should say thanks to Raga for bring, bringing you in. And uh, <laughs> so we would like to be in touch with you for all our future endeavors. Thank you yeah, very please. much, Dr. Jersey. Feel free to reach out. My Surely, pleasure. yes. Through Raga, yeah. we will do it. Yeah, we'll 3D print that Sachi School of Architecture soon. Oh my dear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to have you, Joe's, uh, you know, maybe we, we have, uh, like, uh, thanks to the uh, director man for introducing this uh, uh, concept of collaborating, you know, we can think about uh, maybe, a, maybe a prototype or a workshop. Uh, right. Uh, I will, you know, I, I have um, working with a so company. I guess then uh, we should say thanks to our chairman. Because he's the yeah. one who started yes. this, and we yes. have international <laughs> collaborations through Raghav. He knows, <laughs> he knows people. His networking is good. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Thank he you, was there. I, yeah, the, our chairman was there, but I think due to I think uh, network issues, yeah, he just left. Um, so, but he would uh, like really thank you for giving this opportunity. But you were you were about to say, I think you were accepting our invite for 3D printing jobs. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm working with a company who was uh, willing uh, mm. to fund me to actually mm. 3D print houses in India. Uh, oh, that's so. I don't know how it will evolve. Sometimes it evolves well, sometimes it doesn't. But at least we are working with them. So I'll go back to India next year um, to run yeah. the studio again, the world studio. And uh, that's the first step before actually designing a house for 3D printing in India. So hopefully it will right. happen at some point. We, we, will, we, will, we, will, we will love to host you at Sassy School of Architecture. Yes, and that's an open invitation. Yes, I was yeah. planning to <laughs> say that. Thanks, Raghav. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I read, I understood, ma'am. <laughs> right. Uh, anything else, ma'am? You want? To no, to? that's it. I guess we can wind up. Yeah. Thank you, right. Dr. Joseph. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Bye. Pleasure. Thank you. One day. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all Thanks, the participants. Also. Thank you, ma'am. Arun, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all the participants. Thank you.